And welcome to the breakout session on building relationships between universities and, and industry to accelerate innovation. We have a distinguished group of panelists from three great universities in the heartland of the United States. The campuses of these universities are within about 150 miles of each other, and they are fiercely competitive on the football field and with their sports. But on other aspects, they are remarkably collaborative with each one bringing unique insights and expertise from a highly specialized faculty. These universities are also developing entrepreneurial opportunities and industry partnerships in ways that reflect their respective institutions, goals, and expertise. Our panelists are individuals that are leading transformational activities within each of these institutions. They are expanding the opportunities for professional and student ideas to develop into viable commercial products. And during it all, they are creating ripe environments to optimize collaboration with industry. We are excited for these panelists to, show, to share with you pearls of wisdom from each of their experiences. Our panelists are Greg Deason, Senior Vice President of Entrepreneurship and Placemaking at the Purdue Research Foundation. Kelly Rich, who is the Executive Director of Commercialization at the Idea Center of the University of Notre Dame, and Simran Trana, who is the executive, who is the associate vice president of innovation and commercialization at Indiana University. I am Carol Robertson Plew, and following a few decades in the large pharma R&D space, I now provide strategic and operational advisory services with both. Scott Baxter and I have launched a service organization called Decision Point Insights. Scott? Thanks, Carol. I am thrilled to have this opportunity to co-moderate this session with you. My career is focused on the development and commercialization of new products and technologies across a range of industries around the globe. My focus is now helping universities and early stage companies launch new technologies into the market. Before we start the panel discussion, Carol and I wanted to touch on a few key points. The rapidly changing world is driving new demands for innovation across all industries, and keeping up with the pace of change is extremely difficult for many companies. Digital transformation is driving significant industry changes. Standalone products have been replaced with connected and intelligent solutions. And this has added complexity on many fronts. In order to survive, companies are being forced to rethink how they innovate, moving from internally focused development organizations to faster moving, more nimble development models, and with much more emphasis on external partnerships and investments. Universities and research centers, we feel, can become a significant partner to aid in this transition. COVID-19 has clearly accelerated the transition and the government is also placing greater emphasis on U.S. innovation leadership. One example is the proposed Endless Frontier Act, which includes the investment of $100 billion in technology and research over five years, and also includes an additional $10 billion for 10 regional technology hubs. And as you know, Scott, this year we have seen unprecedented collaboration within the biotech, pharma, and high-tech industries in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Partnerships and collaborations have occurred at a record pace to de develop science-driven, proven solutions for health, well-being, and to enable all of us to work and learn in this new environment, just like we are right now. Illustrated on this slide are a few titles of recent journal manuscripts. There are a couple of key messages here. One, industry is seeking ways to innovate, including new ways to collaborate with academia and with small, nimble companies. And two, the success of collaborations between corporations and academia is being measured, both by universities and by industry authors. Metrics are being tracked to help leaders assess what is, what 
is uh, resulting in successful relationships and what is leading to innovations that will have an impact globally and locally. So there is good reason to evaluate what is working, what is not, and how to improve. So our goal is to help build the bridge between universities and industry to accelerate innovation. Universities and industry are very different, but both strive to discover new inventions and build valuable patent portfolios. As highlighted here, universities talk in terms of startup ecosystems, gaining knowledge in conducting and publishing research. In contrast, the focus of industry is on building R&D capabilities, identifying market needs, providing customer service, and delivering products to meet business milestones. We want to help address these differences to develop more seamless innovation pipelines. And we hope our discussion today takes a small step in that direction. In our panel discussion, we will be targeting three key topics. First, the startup ecosystem, then alliance and relationship management, and finally, facilities and real estate. From this, we will draw out best practice examples from our panelists for building relationships between academia and industry to accelerate innovation. Our panelists, once again, are Greg Deason from uh, the Purdue University, uh, Kelly Rich from the Un uh, University of Notre Dame, and Simran Trana from Indiana University. Greg, let's get started and, and let's start with you. So the Purdue Foundry was uh, started in 2013 and has launched over 300 companies, receiving recognition from U.S. News and World Reports just recently as among the top five universe, innovative universities in the United States. Can you talk a little bit about the, a few key reasons for this success? Yeah, thank you, Carol. I mean, first it starts with a clear mission. We know the mission at the Purdue Research Foundation is to change the world through Purdue Technologies and our graduates. And startups play a critical role in that aspect of translating Purdue technology. Startups can de-risk, they can prove concepts, they prove the markets, they increase technology readiness levels. All of those contribute to making them an integral part of what's interesting to industry. In a university setting like Purdue, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of disclosures of new ideas each year, hundreds of new patents available, you couple that with you know, 42,000 students, thousands of faculties and, and researchers, and it really creates a, a great stage for us to innovate via startups. A lot of our inventions here at Purdue are very applied in the sciences, engineering, and agriculture. I've been in this industry now for about 25 years, and my earliest parts of that were really focused on incubation uh, at a very large scale, but it was really not at the idea phase. And so, as we shifted in 2013 to a new president who had been our governor, Mitch Daniels, we were asked to exponentially increase the number of startups. So what we did is we moved way upstream and began to engage people that had big ideas, but had not really figured out how to take those forward. That led to some programs like Firestarter, which helps those ideas become articulated into value, a market discovery program, which really confirms that value in the marketplace and finds product market fit. And this is where those 300 startups have come from. Uh, we need a lot of volume there. Uh, and it, that's because, you know, it, it really does require a lot of startups to find those highly successful ones. But with that volume, we've been able to amass a number of venture funds here as well and really did move that historical average of IP-based startups from about eight to 25 per year. I think the most interesting thing, though, is the ecosystem itself is improving. We actually had 33 non-IP startups last year, meaning just individuals in the ecosystem. So we, tend, we seem to be gaining momentum, uh, and this becomes a very large draw for, for industry partners to come in that may want to acquire not only the innovation, but the talent that goes with it. That's that's uh, great information, Greg. There there must have been some learnings along the way. So can you uh, talk about, uh, based on your experience, what kind of learnings or, or changes have been made along the path? Well, this idea about creating a throughput uh, that really refines the ideas was critical. So this program I mentioned called Firestarter 
takes people that walk through the door that say they have a big idea, and it really does enable them to articulate their idea in the language of business. But in the COVID era that we're in right now in the pandemic, uh, we have refined that even further. We've gone to virtual programs, which has actually allowed us to do night and weekend programs and reaching a much more large uh, and, and diverse geographic area. So that's something that's been critical to this. But we follow that with market discovery. And this is where you really are interviewing would-be customers. And that becomes the key to actually figuring out if the market agrees with your value proposition and is the key to go, no go. Those two things have really led us down this path. I would say in our latest iteration though, with this huge number of startups available to us, the key right now is how do we select from them a small number to receive special treatment, to receive special funding and opportunities because we think that we can convent, convert those into uh, the next publicly traded or acquisition targets in the future. Uh, so we're excited about that and we're continuing to refine that process. Great, thank Great. you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, let me uh, switch to Kelly. Uh, Kelly, the um, Idea Center at Notre Dame was started in 2017 and has achieved early success launching new companies. I'm impressed with the methodical approach you use to de-risk your companies. Can you describe this approach? Uh, sure. Thank you, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here um, at the Idea Center here at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, as you mentioned, we have a very rigorous de-risking process. It is a stage-gated process that we finally call the uh, commercialization engine. Uh, it's basically, uh, we work with students, faculty, alumni, and community founders to take their early stage technologies or ideas through this uh, de-risking process. So the hope is uh, by um, a rigorous uh, method, we can produce startups on the other side of the process that have a higher chance of success in the marketplace. Uh, the commercialization engine is a, a three-stage process. The first is risk assessment. In that stage, we look at the uh, venture as a whole across 11 different uh, metrics, uh, things like market size, competitive analysis, uh, team and funding, and identify what we think are the uh, biggest risks to success. The next stage is the de-risking stage of the process. Here, similar to what Greg was describing, we do thorough customer discovery work, uh, problem validation, market validation, tech validation. And we're looking to answer um, some questions, namely, first of all, is there a problem big enough in the marketplace to go after? Second, is the solution that the founder has come up with uh, uh, good match for that problem. And finally, the very last thing is, is the actual technology going to work? So we do a series of uh, product development uh, roadmaps and key critical technical tests to really help us determine that. Uh, the final phase of uh, the commercialization engine is uh, enterprise acceleration. So here we take the team, we match them with advisors, management, funding. Uh, we actually have a $23 million uh, ROI fund called the Pit Road Fund here at the Idea Center that we can leverage for that. And then hopefully they're uh, off and running to great success. That's uh, fantastic, Kelly. Uh, second question. You have an interesting background in industry working for the uh, Whirlpool Innovation Lab called W Labs. Uh, is there a best practice from your experience that you brought with you to Notre Dame? Yeah, it was really interesting moving from entrepreneurship within a Fortune 500 company to entrepreneurship. Um, and kind of what I found is there were some best practices uh, in industry at W Labs, uh, mainly around uh, consumer research and insights that I thought were really robust and, and powerful. Um, so I brought some of those uh, to the entrepreneurship world. Uh, entrepreneurs, uh, they tend to like to go really fast and quick, but sometimes the processes aren't quite as rigorous as industry. So taking those industry practices and really um, making them faster, but maintaining the high quality of the research is what we tried to do. Uh, one example of that is a quantitative concept testing. So at W Labs, we would spend lots of money and lots of time to actually get 300 plus respondents 
friends uh, to tell them how interested they would be in purchasing an item. Uh, we took that same concept, but uh, moved it to a more agile world here at the Idea Center and uh, leverage uh, a platform, a research platform that can turn those results around very quickly within 24 hours. Uh, the other thing we're excited about is uh, I had a lot of extensive experience at Whirlpool and W Labs with crowdfunding campaigns. Those are great ways to validate the market. And we've brought those techniques here to the Idea Center as well. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kill. Simran, um, IU as a, a university has the largest medical school in the United States and also a very highly regarded business uh, school. And it's very interesting to me that you're developing programs to leverage these strengths. One example is the Physician Entrepreneurship Program, which is generating startup companies from these medical experts. Can you tell us more about these successful programs? Simran, I think you're on mute. Can you, there you go. Thank you, Carol. And thank you all and apologize for that. Um, as Greg and Kelly were mentioning, you know, when we talk about a startup ecosystem, there are really three main components of that that you need to have for successful commercialization. The first is the ideas. And between uh, Notre Dame, Purdue, and IU, there's about $1.5 billion in research funding that goes into essentially groundbreaking research to develop the next generation of technologies that are going to drive our economy. And so with that engine in place, you know, it's really remarkable the ideas and the thoughts and um, you know, inventions that come out of the university. So there's certainly we have that innovative but innovation potential here. The next two components that are really critical are talent and funding. And I think that is the space that particularly, you know, the Midwest struggles with, and that's a place where we put a lot of effort into, as Greg and Kelly mentioned, and we continue to need to do more work to develop uh, our resources in that space. When it comes to IU in the area of talent, we're looking to see how do we make entrepreneurship a component of our teaching and strengthen the ability of the new uh, students as well as faculty that are part of the uh, IU universe to start these companies and translate their technology into uh, products and services for consumption by um, uh, our social ecosystem. Um, in that regard, we have, as you mentioned, the Physician MBA program, and that is particularly targeted at faculty to see how do we have faculty and train them uh, to look at developing their own technology further into startups or companies that can then be of interest to industry. Because I think that's been a well-recognized shift across um, all of um, uh, product development as well as commercialization, that industries are moving further and further uh, downstream in terms of acquiring companies that have de-risked the technology and taken it through a certain stage of development. So ensuring that we have faculty that have the skills and the talent and the ability to, to go down that road. In addition to that, we have programs for undergraduates, for example, through the Entrepreneurship Center at the Kelly School, again, led by Don Karatko, for our engineering students and our students at the Luddy School of Informatics and Computer Engineering. There's the Shoemaker Scholars Program, which really takes cohorts of students through this entrepreneurship program and helps them understand what they need to do. So developing the talent that we can engage with to take these technologies to market is a large um, issue for us. And then developing it internally as well as engaging externally with people who have been successful entrepreneurs and connecting them with faculty is where we, we look to those leaders to help us develop the companies. And the last part is capital. And again, uh, as Kelly and Greg mentioned, every, every program that wants to do startups has to have some kind of translational and gap funding program. So IU has uh, translational funds that we provide to our faculty to, to bridge that early stage development. And then we partner with IU, uh, IU Ventures that has a philanthropic fund to support further commercialization. And then in addition to that, the state with Elevate Ventures, I think is a particularly good partner for Notre Dame, IU and Purdue to help us take those technologies further and then we have our angel funds and other um, venture capital funds that we participate with. So having that whole um, gamut of um, resources is essential to that um, innovation system. And that's what we're all working to develop. 
Thanks, Simran. You, you are fairly new to your role at IU, but you've had a tremendous amount of experience in both academia as well as industry, most recently coming back to academia from industry. Have you begun to formulate any new strategies for technology commercialization? And I really want to piggyback on what Kelly said, you know, articulating and developing a very definite stage gate process so that we understand what level of investment is needed to take a technology from where it is to the next go, no go decision. I think that is really critical. And, you know, what Kelly and Greg described, they really formalized that process. And that's something that IU is in the process of doing. Okay, thanks, Simran. Let's uh, switch. We're going to switch to alliance and relationship management as the next topic. Uh, relationships and alliances occur on many levels. With almost any positive work and collaboration, it begins with individual relationships, which can potentially build into a lasting business collaboration. So we'll start with Greg. Greg, can you provide us an example of a relationship with industry that has been a success and the value your university delivered in this process? Yeah, sure, Scott. Thank you. I mean, this always starts around talent and, and whether that is the ability to recruit and retain world-class talent into a company or talent that can deliver solutions, that has always been the key. And I think in the case of some really great recruitments this last couple of years, Saab, Schweitzer Engineering Labs is an example. The Saab example is probably one of the best where they could have built that facility anywhere in the world. They came here because of the opportunity for us to work collaboratively, collaboratively with them on some solutions to things that they want to advance in their industry. So uh, there's a huge aspect of this that's around talent. I think as we look at this, we try to think about it in terms of what promises that we've made that we need to keep. That relates to not only talent and research, but it relates to incentives and the physical realm that they need. And then we look from there to, to holistically grow the relationship. So uh, that's a great example right now that we're working on. Uh, they will be moving into their facility in the next month or two. About 300 workers will be there, and they've, they've already had great success in bringing new talent to the area. That sounds like a great success, Greg. Uh, Kelly, so uh, management of these alliances becomes a very critical piece. Can you tell us how you are working with industry at Notre Dame? Sure. I'd like to highlight uh, one of our most successful industry programs. Uh, here at the Idea Center, we have a, uh, the ESTEAM program. The ESTEAM program is an 11-month uh, master's in innovation and entrepreneurship program. As part of that, uh, there is a capstone project that each student works on individually, and these are often sponsored by industry. Um, so industry comes to us with a problem or a need for innovation, connect them with one of these students, and they work for 11 months solely on this project, applying all of their education and learning to a real-world uh, application. Uh, it's been great success for us. Uh, most recently, we had a woman graduate from the program. Uh, while she was in it, she developed a new high-end uh, bicycle component for a company called SRAM out of Chicago. They ended up hiring her after graduation, and then she has subsequently sold um, the STEAM into this company, and we've had two projects with them ongoing. So I, I love that connection between students, education, and industry, and it becomes a, a cyclical process. Uh, it's, that's a fantastic uh, benefit for the students at Notre Dame. And Simran, um, Indiana University has the largest medical school in the U.S. Can you tell us about some of your industry partnerships? So, well, as you said, Scott, um, the you know, Indiana University is really blessed having a great group of scientists, physicians, nurses, social workers, and technologists that can work closely with industry to help them take their technologies to market. So we actually have a separate unit. You know, most universities have an Office of Research Administration. At IU, we have that as well. But given this particular area of engagement, we have a separate Office of Clinical Research and they work exclusively with uh, companies that want to do clinical trials at IU. And those can lead into many uh, additional relationships. So we have a relationship with Lonza that started in clinical trials, but as a result of that relationship, getting to know faculty, getting to know the research that's going on at IU, it's generated and moved forward into a collaborative relationship 
where Lonza is actually licensed IU technology and is developing it uh, for to address cancer uh, patients and cancer develop cancer therapies. And IU is going to use proprietary technology that Alonza has developed in the CAR-T uh, technology area and use exclusively their methodology to deliver the technology. So it's, it's where you start off with an initial, maybe less engaged relationship, but it's resulted into something that is a joint collaboration where we're both investing in the development of the technology and will hopefully deliver very innovative new uh, therapies for cancer patients. Excellent, excellent example. Um, Carol? Yeah, let's uh, switch now to the topic of facilities and real estate. Creating communities of innovation is a theme of this meeting. Can you each describe the real estate and facilities that you have available and how you are creating communities of innovation and attracting major corporate partners? Let's hear from Kelly and then we'll go to Greg and then go to Simran. Go. Sure. Um, so the Idea Center is housed in Innovation Park uh, here on the campus of Notre Dame. It is a 80,000 square foot building. We have over 60 companies uh, within our facilities. Also, it is a center for all entrepreneurship activities that occur at the university. So in addition to the commercialization engine that I mentioned previously, the esteem education program, masters, the 11 month masters. We also have a uh, innovation lab, which is a fabrication lab for prototyping. And um, finally, we have uh, the Lilly Grant um, industry lab as well. That's uh, working with the community on uh, increasing um, innovation within um, the local ecosystem. Uh, why people come here, obviously for the connection to students, connection, to faculty and of course the uh, beautiful view of the golden dome that I have from my office so you can't discount that at all as well so it's a it's a wonderful facility to to work in it really promotes uh, these um, innovative collisions amongst uh, different types of companies uh, students and faculty that are really beneficial for innovation I'll piggyback on that I think um, this idea of collisions, I mean, activation is, is in fact the name of the game here. How do you activate a whole variety of constituents? You know, Purdue's had research parks since the 60s and it's large scale, millions of square feet, 5,000 employees alone here in West Lafayette. But the, the place I find myself now is how do we bring that action closer to campus? I'm fortunate we're investing more than a billion dollars right now uh, on the edge of campus, right on State Street, the main street in, in our campus. But in that, we've created something we call the Convergence Center for Innovation and Collaboration. And as the name implies, it's bringing together a lot of different constituents. At the top of our program, we talked about startups. The foundry is in this location. Our Office of Technology Commercialization is in this location. Those that interface with industry from a research perspective are in this location. We also have about 70 small offices for corporations and large scale office areas for corporations. But the goal is to mash all these things together to create an ecosystem that is live, work, play, and learn. Just down the street from me, uh, thousands of residential units ranging from single family to apartments to townhomes, shops, restaurants, and so forth. But all of those things work together to create an active environment where industry can be here and have access to talent, whether that be students or researchers, access to startups, and access to those of us who can facilitate those relationships. I think probably the one great thing ahead of us is to figure out how to integrate the well-established community that's up a few miles from here in the Purdue Research Park with this new area that we call the Discovery Park District, a true innovation district. And at IU, you know, we are fortunate to have two flagship campuses, essentially. We have our medical school campus based in Indianapolis, and then we have our liberal arts and science and engineering campus in uh, Bloomington. So we're looking, as we look at developing our, our uh, we, and, and IU does not have a research park of its own. So we're looking to partner with, uh, with the city of Indianapolis and the development that's going on in Indy to support our, uh, in our IUPUI campus. 
And in that regard, 16 Tech is a development that's being um, developed and, and is moving forward right now. With their first building coming online in early 2021, uh, barring any, any unforeseen changes occurred that may occur due to the pandemic. And that is going to help us kind of centralize all the innovative resources around Indiana with Bio Crossroads, which is an organization that helps uh, encourage and build new enterprises as well as attract industry in the life sciences area. We have the Institute uh, uh, ICBI, which is the Indiana Center for Biomedical Innovation. That is also going to be co-located there along with our office, hopefully we'll move into that space as well. So we're looking to build that kind of community in Indianapolis. I'm really envious of Greg and Kelly and what they've been able to build at Notre Dame and Purdue. IU is further behind, but we're hoping to catch them up, uh, catch up with them on that and learn from them as we build our resources. And then in Bloomington, we have uh, in a few, about three years ago, the Dimension Mill was started uh, in partnership with the city of Bloomington and the Bloomington Economic Development Council to provide that same kind of uh, startup entrepreneurship uh, incubation space. And more than just the space, it's the community, as Greg and Kelly mentioned, you know, a place where like-minded people can come together for support. They support each other and the or institute and the their um, organization as well as the region gets to support them to take their technologies to market in this very challenging and very complex space. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of people holding hands to make this successful. So we, we hope to get there in partnership with the state, with our regions and with the cities that we, we're operating in. Thank you so much, uh, Simran. We're getting uh, close to wrapping things up and, and I'd like to ask each one of our panelists to take one minute, just one minute, to share one key learning that would improve the success of collaborations with industry. This could be using an example from the past or adjustments your university will be making moving forward. So this time, let's go Greg first, then Simran, then Kelly. Thank you, Carol. I mean, I think one of the things that we have learned is it's so important for you to listen to the industry partner as opposed to continually just demonstrate your capability or show them your next great invention. We've created a process called strategic exploration that forces us, the discipline, to understand their problems fully before we begin to offer solutions. That is a discipline that I think is going to pay off for us. Within that, we also get that entire group of people that I mentioned uh, that are interfacing with industry on a pan purdue basis together every Thursday morning to talk about what we're doing with different companies and to strategize and make sure that we're coordinated, collaborating, and communication, communicating effectively. Carol, what I would add to that is essentially, you know, you do need dedicated resources for this function. And I'll give you an example of something that we tried and didn't work. And then based on the feedback you get, you have to stop doing certain things. So we had a spin-up program where we were trying to do everything ourselves by helping faculty startup companies, taking a significant equity role in those startup companies and then trying to get them started. And that required so much resource from the university and the office that we weren't able to do that successfully. So we've actually closed that down and now we're looking to partner externally. And those partnerships are really, really important to bring in you know, seasoned entrepreneurs as early as we can with the right opportunities, get them engaged, get the technology out under terms that makes easy sense and, and uh, is, is something that's um, attractive to our, our business partners and let them uh, take that technology to market. So course correcting, it's listening to your audience and then making sure we do things uh, differently if needed is, is a critical success factor. One thing I would mention that we learned is uh, back to the resource issue. Uh, we learned that companies a lot of times don't have adequate uh, resources uh, to drive innovation within their companies. They might have ideas on the shelf, but not enough time or talent or funding to move those forward. So we're trying to think towards the future of creative, innovative ways of how we can engage with industry in a more productive fashion. Uh, for example, our commercialization engine, how can we leverage that to help companies really stimulate innovation uh, within, within their four walls? Really good. Scott, I think we need to start uh, looking towards wrapping up. Yep. 
let's do that. Uh, I think you have a slide to pull up. I do. And here we go. So, so let's, let's hone in on some of what we heard from our panelists. It's important to grow and enhance the startup ecosystem with clear processes and to establish staff and student programs to cultivate their entrepreneurial thinking and to create a resource hub where experts in various aspects of business can be tapped and funding sources can start to be identified. These promote innovations that may be keys to creating successful industry partnerships, such as the acquisition model that Greg had mentioned in his talk. Now moving to alliance and relationship management, um, we know that this is critical for success. And we've heard that resonated from each of our uh, panelists. So the key messages here are encourage professional relationships between your industry and the university experts, because these are what may lead to collaborative contracts with corporations. Also consider assessing your institution's strengths and aligning them with the industry partner's needs to optimize positive outcomes. In, in uh, facilities and real estate processes and timelines need to be communicated for obtaining partnership agreements and contracts. Uh, facilities and infrastructure need to be designed which foster collaboration and integrate faculty, students, and employees from private companies. Well, folks, that wraps it up. I want to thank AURP, Carol and our panelists, each representing an outstanding school in Indiana, Greg Deason from the Purdue Research Foundation, Kelly Rich from the Idea Center at Notre Dame, and Simran Trainer from Indiana University. Thank you for a very informative discussion. Thank you all. Yeah. Okay, I think we have some time to take some audience questions. And uh, the first question we have, I, I cannot tell who sent this in. It's uh, in a code name or a code uh, um, instead of the full name. Uh, it says, uh, great session. Thank you for sharing your expertise from Purdue, Notre Dame, and Indiana. The structure of, uh, of the Entrepreneurship Assistance Roadmap is very helpful. How are business students helping STEM founders? How are you involving alumni as mentors? So uh, our panelists can each uh, uh, take that on. Um, perhaps I'll uh, call on each one of you as, um, as uh, it, it might be appropriate. So Greg, would you like to take that first? Yeah, I'm happy to, to jump in on that. And uh, one of the things that's really important, I think, in, in this realm is to kind of understand uh, both the needs of existing industry and startups. And the startup realm would tell you that student involvement is invaluable. There's a lot going on about a go, no-go decision at that point. And so in our case, MBA students, for example, are actually working in the foundry especially to do market analysis, financial modeling, things of that nature. But in the undergraduate ranks, our companies are the case studies used in the experiential learning programs in the business school. And then there's a student managed venture fund that actually does due diligence on our startup companies with the intent of an investment being made at the end. And uh, the, the pace that those, uh, those put our startups through, very, very important. The reason I said though that it matters whether you're working with a startup or whether you're working with existing business, sometimes if you've got an existing business, say in your research park, trying to rely on student data, uh, it, it can be a little frustrating. And I learned that sort of the hard way because sometimes students have different deadlines. They've got finals coming up. They're going to take a break. Whereas that, that ongoing concern might need that data tomorrow to make decisions about what they're doing. And so in the realm of the startups though, especially as you're trying to analyze a go, no, go decision or pathway forward, very critical. Would also say that one of the other disciplines we've had is to make sure that what being what's being taught in the entrepreneurship programs and the B-School is consistent with what we do in the applied area of the foundry. So business model canvas, you're not going to walk in the foundry and say, oh, no, no, we don't do that. No, we're going to say, let's now take the work product and take it forward. In terms of the alumni engagement, We've got more than a thousand alumni that have been involved in mentoring companies. We've even got a, a boil down of that called executive mentors. In fact, Carol, you and Scott uh, both have participated in that and helped our companies. So you know firsthand 
that that's invaluable to add people with industry experience. But even in the Silicon Valley area, we've got about 30 alumni there called the Silicon Valley Boilermaker Innovation Group. They specifically select our companies sort of through a pitch competition and then work with them, a group of Bay Area alumni that want to help. Interesting. So uh, Kelly, uh, looks like you're ready to answer next and I'm, then Simran will call on you next. Sure, I'm ready. Uh, so at the Idea Center, we employ students throughout our commercialization process. Uh, we, we do tap into the MBA students uh, over at Mendoza to really help um, our, mostly our alumni and community founders um, with the risk assessment part of the stage gate process. We also employ undergraduates as uh, interns within the commercialization engine, and they typically will work on the risk assessment for faculty technology. So those students that we target are really the uh, STEM undergrad students. Uh, in addition, we have a McCloskey business plan competition once a year and um, students are encouraged to form teams around innovation. So we even will match students with um, community and alumni founders who want to participate in that in that pitch. Uh, finally, on the alumni, uh, similar to Greg, we have a really engaged group of alumni that love to help the Idea Center. We have a network of about 1,400 that have signed up and said, hey, tap into me if you need expertise in any area. And then we have uh, two programs for alumni. Uh, the first is called the Founder Coach Program. So what it does is it matches our experienced uh, entrepreneur alumni network, uh, those with successful exits with uh, budding student entrepreneurs to uh, help kind of guide them through the process with weekly meetings. And then for alumni who have ideas on new innovations, but don't have the time to actually lead the company themselves. And we, we take their idea and match it with uh, a student entrepreneur who, um, is a good fit for that. And, and they kind of do the day-to-day -day work as a CEO to take that forward. Great example. Very similar to what Kelly and Greg mentioned, IU also has uh, an internship program for students. Uh, we'd like to rotate about nine students to the office every year uh, with backgrounds in STEM, commerce, as well as information technology. Uh, and, and essentially have them help uh, analyze our technologies and working with faculty and grad students to assess the potential size of the opportunity and the strength of the IP. So we do both of those in-house. Uh, and then uh, in terms of working with alumni, we tend to work more through IU Ventures, which is a, a sort of an established relationship that has been developed. And we use them to identify both lead uh, business partners for technologies. So we can actually have them come in and, and lead the technology and the company. And then on the other side, also definitely as advisors, um, as Greg and Kelly, you know, it, it, it's nothing unique, but I think all of us understand and realize that our alum, alumni are incredibly powerful and useful and, and productive members for innovation, both in terms of vetting the technology. So we have them advise us at times of technologies that we should invest in and which ones we need to move forward further, uh, help establish a path for commercialization as well in specific areas, how they can advise us in terms of what are the next steps we should do, um, lead the companies and then also provide funding. So your alumni network is incredibly important in all of those areas. Great, uh, Simran, thanks. Um, I'm just gonna pick another question that's on the list here. Uh, it says, uh, great discussion, thank you. How often do you do an inventory of the university and park's strengths and assets and the local industry ecosystem to match their strengths and needs? And, uh, and again, I think we'll start with, uh, with Greg here. Uh, it, I think at some level, the answer is, is that, that is ongoing, uh, but, but I don't wanna just leave it there. Um, we do, we do a deep dive, especially pocketed deep dives uh, on, a, on an ongoing rotating basis. So presently we're working with the College of Agriculture. We're using a Six Sigma style process to really figure out how we can create better innovation there. 
Uh, but I, I think that, that this conversation is one that's got to be ongoing because there are not only core competencies that are in, in evidence at the university that, uh, that we have, but there are also emerging core competencies. For yeah. example, quantum computing, uh, deep learning. Those are things that you know, are, are on the rise and we know that there's going to be something there. Where we play a key role though is how does that match to markets? I think the other thing that, that we're mindful of, we've got a, a great opportunity right now in the area of radio pharmacy. Uh, that's something that Purdue teaches in, in the pharmacy school, but Indiana is uniquely positioned from a logistics perspective to deliver things with half-lives quickly to a lot of the population. And so um, I, I think there's, there's sort of an ongoing aspect of that, but I would tell you that um, on a college by college basis, we go through a rotation of that. And then just in, in our team alone, uh, we take a deep dive at least annually to figure out uh, wh where we are, how well we're matching that up. And I mentioned in the, in the tape session, a weekly call called the Book of Business Call where all of those outward facing industry engaging individuals get together. And that is just to make sure that none of us miss that. You know, universities are huge places, they're complex places. And the collective wisdom of that group is so much better than the individual wisdom of, of the participants. Right, um, maybe uh, Kelly? Yes, Guy, uh, would you mind repeating the question real quick? It says, uh, how often do you do an inventory of the university and park strengths and assets and the local industry ecosystem to match their strengths and needs? I think it's about aligning with the, uh, the trends in industry. The community. Yeah. So uh, similar to what Greg mentioned, ours is more of an ongoing uh, type of assessment. We, we are heavily involved with the uh, community here within South Bend, and there's uh, really close ties with um, SUSB, for example, which is a South Bend startup uh, organization. So we're um, meeting monthly to figure out how we can best align our commercialization uh, talents and services with the needs of the entrepreneurs in the area. Um, so that's something that, um, you know, we do really on a, on a regular basis. Uh, we also internally have uh, what we call postmortem, which is a terrible name, actually, yeah. you know, but yeah. we, we basically get to get our whole idea center operations when we get together twice a year to assess what's working and what isn't working and how can we serve our um, customers better. So we, you know, we're really big into uh, continuous improvement here. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, things, things change so fast, you're just holding on to people's coattails, <laughs> but it's a, it's a really good formalized twice a year forum that we, we do a internal self-assessment. Super, super. Um Simran, don't know if you might have some thoughts on this topic. Well, um, I don't know if the question was specifically about a university park um, kind of environment, but at IU, uh, we have uh, a, we are part of the community, and we look at how our offices services can fit with other community organizations, how we can work with them, uh, and we try. I, I'm not aware of anything formal that we do in that regard, but again, it's an ongoing conversation as opportunities come up, looking for opportunities to fund, to, to develop new resources for the community and anything that will help to continue to build on that in that ecosystem that we're trying to develop. Okay, super. Maybe, uh, Carol, you want to take the next one here? Sure. We've got a couple of uh, very interesting questions. One, I think, is more of a comment, and I'm, I'm going to throw both of these out at you all at the same time. Uh, one is a great session, really interested in startup case studies for business classes. So I think that's as much of a comment as it is a, a question, but I'm gonna let you all noodle on that a little bit while I also pull up this other question that says, how are campus arts programs incorporated into the collaborations? And uh, so uh, Simran, I'm gonna put you on the spot first because uh, IU of course has one of the premier uh, music programs in the entire United States. So it's a really interesting question. And, and so we'll, we'll work on both of those at the, at the same time. So Simran, go first. 
So in terms of uh, taking business opportunities or potential business opportunities, I should say, and matching them with classes for case studies, uh, the way we do them now is not in a retrospective way, but in a more prospective way. So if we have a technology and we've figured out uh, and we're trying to understand who would be the right potential customers for it, we're doing customer discovery, we're looking to identify potential partners and maybe even sometimes trying to identify what are the applications for certain technologies. As you are aware, um, you know, university technology often can has been sometimes criticized as a solution looking for a problem. And so when we have great technology, we sometimes have to understand what is the first place to apply it. And so putting the technology and the information together in a way that we present it to students and they can then help us with that customer discovery piece and really identify where the, what are the potential applications we should pursue. And actually there have been great examples of success uh, with, with students to do that. On the other side, when it comes to arts faculty, um, it's been interesting, you know, uh, at IU we are uniquely situated where we have a significant social program and we license a lot of copyright, we help faculty engage with potential opportunities to display their works. And so it's a whole new area for me. I started in IU in February of this year and really getting our heads around how we help the arts faculty in terms of developing solutions. We have a software app that's currently under development of how to connect uh, different performing artists and help them go out and engage with um, potential um, clients as well as audiences. So it's, it's a new area for us, but clearly uh, there's, I think also, you know, how, how do you have new games come out and present them? So creating easy avenues for small applications or apps or web apps or technology and making sure that we can facilitate getting that to the market for students and faculty is something we're working on right now is how do we make that streamline that and make that really easy for both students and faculty. Yeah, and I guess here at the Idea Center, we've uh, developed a really close collaborative relationship with the uh, Department of Design. Uh, for example, we've recently ramped up um, week-long design sprints uh, based on the Google Venture model, where we get a team together to uh, tackle um, a certain market problem. And throughout the week, by the end of the week, you have a no code prototype in hand and you've interviewed uh, five potential customers to see if there's traction and that is a extremely intensive uh, design effort needed so we we kind of started uh, pulling in uh, students uh, from the design school uh, to help us with that initiative and it's great experience for them to actually go, go through uh, innovation week-long innovation project and uh, get some real world experience and it provides us with uh, much needed uh, design resources so that's been that's been a great collaboration yeah, and from the Purdue perspective I think the a couple comments just in terms of the case study work uh, these are are typically uh, emerging cases not not necessarily those that are looking at a post-mortem uh, I think if you could just sort of say, what are the outcomes you're looking for? A lot of times in the startup world, you're thinking about five first. Who's that first team? Who's going to be the first money, the first prototype, the first market, and, and defining then who the first customer could be. Uh, a lot of the real value, though, is often added in that market analysis to try to figure out pathways forward. So that's a piece of that. And then I mentioned the student venture fund. Those are literally more mature companies that we're about to stroke checks and invest in. And so there, it's a, it's a very deep due diligence period that they, they take them through to learn that discipline. On the arts side, I mean, I think, you know, by and large, Purdue is dominant in ag and in engineering, but we do have a design school as well, as Kelly mentioned. And I think there, the form factors come in. But I think the other thing that is just important here is you need creative people mashed together. And uh, whether they're musicians, of course, you know, I, I, I'm in that bucket uh, some days and some evenings, but, um, but I think the other part of this is we, we are uh, trying to create a community of creative, of innovative people. And so when we reach into the design school or when we, we look at others that are involved in the arts at Purdue, uh, that is something that enriches the community. I think in some ways it also is an area 
where we can, in fact, round out the experience of our corporate partners, mention those corporate partners, but being involved in activities where uh, there's theater, where there's music, where there's art, are also very enriching activities that we try to emphasize more on the community integration side of things. Great. Well, I think uh, it's getting late. Uh, I think we've gone well past our time. Um, I wanna thank the audience for their participation and for a lot of good questions. I wanna, uh, of course, thank our panel, Simran, Greg, and Kelly. Great conversation, really appreciate it. I wanna thank Carol, uh, I think it was a great job by everyone. Uh, and Carol, maybe if you wanna have a final comment. I, uh, I think we're ready to wrap up. Uh, we have gone over our time and, and I think the examples that we've heard today of uh, both the startup, the, the startup ecosystem, the alliance and relationship management and, and also managing and enhancing and growing your facilities and real estate have been uh, really well spoken and uh, great job by all of our panelists. So thank you so much. And thank you to the audience members who sent in questions. Uh, Scott and I are uh, pleased to be with you today. We have uh, uh, now have a company called Decision Point Insights, and we'd love to connect with you all to see how we can uh, also augment your programs. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank Good you. night, everyone. Bye-bye.